One of the many reasons that people were really angry and inflamed yesterday about what David Sampson did, taking the side of corporate billionaires and employers on the side of greed, is because all over our country, laborers are striking for what feels like decency, for dignity in the workplace. And a lot of employers are saying, get your ass back to work, go, go to the office, go work in the office. We're not particularly caring about what the human being needs. So there are strikes all over, and it feels like our economy is being jostled by some of this stuff. The most interesting one to me, as someone who has so many friends in the writing industry, is what's happening in Hollywood as... Wall Street and tech companies basically devour Hollywood and entertainment the way they did journalism. And it's now five months in on writers really hurting because they don't have the money that the actors do or the top end actors do. And many actors are putting forth Ben Affleck and J-Lo, uh, a bunch of them, a million dollars each, The Rock, to help keep solidarity. Because solidarity is hard when you need to pay rent, when you've got electricity bills, when some of these writers are striking and know they can strike because if I get a waiting job, I can also make as much money because my wages are so So I can make it through some of this, but it's about to get really tense when you're fighting people who have all the money in the world and now you're five months in and you were hoping to have a settlement on what is your career and your future. In the middle of this, Bill Maher, like Drew Barrymore, is ready to cross a picket line without writers. Mike Schur, who is at the center of this fight, told us recently, while disappointed and hoping that Drew Barrymore wouldn't cross the picket line, that he understood that there are also a lot of support staff members that aren't writers that are also struggling and need the work of the economy. So it can't be total solidarity because there are people you also care about that have to be paid. I will tell you a story that happened to me at ESPN that was a real bummer for me. Uh, when the pandemic hit and Disney decided, hey, uh, top end employees on income have to give back or volunteer to give back 10 percent or 20 percent of their income. I don't remember what it was. Um, you have to volunteer. It's volunteering. But in our case, it wasn't really volunteering because we were already in a precarious spot and things would be counted against you, I felt like. But I asked if that money could go to a bunch of cameramen and people who uh, worked for us for many years on Highly Questionable, who didn't even speak English, some of them, who were the ones in our environment. I didn't mind giving the money back, but I asked if it could take care of them, and the answer was no. <laughs> and so I paid them anyway right. during the pandemic myself, which Bill Maher is not doing here. Bill Maher is saying... I need my support staff back at work, and so I'm going to make them money that way. Now, Bill Maher has enough money that he can do this if he wanted to be in solidarity, but he's also an ego monster, and he needs the cameras, and he's selfish, and he uh, said, uh, you know, a few days ago that the strike is complicated, and he made it sound like it was complicated, but it's not complicated. He wants to go back to work. He wants to be back on television. He wants to do his show, and he's filing it under this is all complicated and there are little people. But if you wanted to be in solidarity with everybody else, he would just take care of his support staff himself. He could figure out ways to do it the same way Jimmy Fallon and the late night hosts are doing it by doing work on podcasts right now and raising money for them. He wants to go back to work, and it makes me want to talk to all of you about Bill Maher, because what's happened with him to, to me is just super fascinating. I've always admired his content. I really have. I think he is really good at what he does, and I wish when he made what was a sacrilegious documentary about religion, I wish that he could have done that funny and taken some of the obnoxious tone out of it because it would have made it more accessible to people instead of you're an who has to be right about everything, and you're delivering this documentary this way, the content is someone who was raised Catholic. I'm like, I don't totally agree with everything that you're doing here, but you're doing it as a maximum, 
which is how Bill Maher does everything. Hate that about him. But it's also why he's still almost 70, shouting at clouds and children, and he's always in the headlines. Do you know how hard it is to be someone like Bill Maher at this age, 20 years in, after having your politically incorrect show canceled because you said the 9-11 kamikaze pilots could be called a lot of things, but not cowards. You couldn't call them cowards because they gave their lives for something. He got a show called Politically Incorrect canceled, and he has still been in the conversation all these years later because he's very good at what he does. But in the world that he occupies, none of those dudes or women like him very much. And he seems angry and sad and bitter, even though, like I will tell you again, I mean, I like his content. I like his show. It has survived and evolved, even though I don't agree with much of what he's doing now. It feels to me right. like an angry old person who doesn't like that young people want something softer than what he is. Is, is it that or is it he, it's the time honored tradition of he does care about the people that work for him that aren't unionized, that aren't going to be in, you know, taken care of by any of these negotiations. But I just don't want to be the one that pays for it, right? Is he just being selfish? Not not necessarily like you stupid kids on your strike or whatever. Like supportive, but also, hey, I don't want my people to suffer, but also I don't want to have to pay for them either. But isn't there a creative way to do all of that? If you're Bill Maher and can spring up an economy with a podcast on the side that yeah. can make all sorts of it's money. Work. That's extra work, you know. <laughs> okay, but I mean. But that's but I mean, I guess, it's going to be a lot more work than you he's want, ever faced. You want your principal to be totally lazy? Like if yeah, you no. want to be solidarity with the union, if you want to be solidarity with workers, you want to do it the easiest way possible? That's what I'm saying. That's probably the most likely thing, which is not commendable, but also not as bad as like I. This is a stupid strike, right? And I think the strike itself. Th there's a lot of conversation that not necessarily is opposed to the concept of striking, but just little things. Mike, you and I were talking about this earlier about the the idea that you know, uh, hey, if this thing wins and we get disclosures as a result this could be cataclysmic in the opposite direction for the writers for the screen actors etc yeah andrew schultz early in the strike posed the theory that uh if you may not want to go all the way down this road with this strike because if we're asking for disclosures from publicly traded companies netflix is going to fall apart because netflix actually has to reveal not as many people as we've maybe insinuated are actually watching these things and then ultimately there's less dollars to go around anyways because one of the pillars of this whole entertainment industry has fallen down essentially crumbling because it was all a facade the but illusion the illusion oh my, my fault jerry but the illusion needs to stand that <laughs> we cannot Reveal that the emperor wears no clothes. The thing with Bill Maher, bringing it back to him in particular, is expecting anything less than selfishness from Bill Maher, I think, is just where the expectations have to be would be surprising. Like, Bill Maher is going to make the selfish move, and that's where a lot of his content has also shifted, right? It's that he came on to the scene as this wacky leftist, all just simply because he was atheist. Like, that was his big leftist movement. A lot of his other sort of political ideals that he preached on his show were pretty centrist. And so in turn, he's lamenting the young left for being soft and all of these things when he was really never that far left to begin with. And I think that that sort of ideal, that sort of mentality is trickling over here into let me be the guy that says everything that I think that I write, I don't need a team. Uh, I run the risk of pissing people off. I've never been, well, I was a part of the Screen Actors Guild at one point, but I don't remember that really. Um, that's not a look at me Louie thing. I don't have a lot of experience being a, an active member of a union. So I read his very lengthy tweet that, that we put up there, and I see the context of him going without writers, admitting that it's going to be worse. And he is essentially doing a podcast because he's doing it, what he usually does with a panel, mm -hmm. just on the video format. I guess the big sin is just by crossing the picket line and not oh, – I don't guess. I know that it, that is the thing. But when you put up the context, I do think he acquitted himself as best you could considering the circumstances. He's not doing a monologue. He's not doing new rules. He's not doing all the other stuff. He's just doing, as Mike said, just the panel. So he's kind of like, I'm not kind of replacing the writers. I'm not getting scabs. I'm just 
kind of cutting those parts out and saying up front, the show will not be as good. But he has to write. He's one of the writers. He's going to be the centerpiece. Does of he have show. to write if he's holding like a, a – I don't – I say this naively. Does, does he have to write? He has to do research for himself. But is, if he's having a conversational panel like he usually does, I, I don't really see the the harm in that. It's just ultimately it's, it just seems and looks a little bad because like Liam Neeson standing up for the women's rights, but you want to take a pay cut? <laughs> no, no, you no, feel no, me? No, no, That's no, what it feels no. like. When you talk about selfish, though, what I do feel, what I recognize in him that he's doing, I recognize it back when newspaper writers were threatened by the arrival of Deadspin, and they wanted their own space to themselves, and they didn't want to share it. And here came all these young people with different opinions, and they want Bill Maher to be something different than he is. And he's like, no, I want the right to choose the rules, new rules, for everyone. <laughs> I don't know how many people in the audience have been reading about artificial intelligence, but it is totally scaring how you arrive at artificial intelligence, which is Google or one of these tech companies paying human beings a very, very small amount of money to put into the computers what needs to be known so we can replace human beings. Like, that is what is the scariest part of what Silicon Valley is doing to the entirety of the economy, that human beings, the cheapest and cheapest of labor, is being paid to feed the machine the stuff that will replace us so that the machines can get good enough to be scary. And one thing I had never considered until very recently, because I didn't understand the business at all, is how Netflix was in the business, more than entertainment, of information. How Netflix would buy Adam McKay's movie, Don't Look Up, $200 million or whatever it is that that costs, and not give him any information afterward about how it had done, beyond saying hugely popular, very big thing. Billy Corbin makes for Hulu, God forbid, most popular, all they'll give you is most popular documentary in the history of Hulu, but don't give the director any numbers, any information. We take your intellectual property, it is ours, here are these millions of dollars. Netflix doesn't reveal anything to anyone and becomes the biggest player in the game because they're willing to spend money all over the place until now when they're not and the industry feels like it's collapsing. And not just because of the strike, because do we have a bogus economy at the middle of it? Do we have Netflix, if they don't have to reveal their numbers to anybody, who was the character in Succession who had, an, who had a problem in India? What was the name of the character, the foreign character? who? Uh, oh, Madsen? Madsen, yeah. Yeah, we got to fudge the numbers because we've got a bunch of numbers in India that aren't real. Like, if the economies are false, if the economy of entertainment isn't real, and there are some people controlling the numbers, but the stock prices doesn't even know what their numbers are because they're controlling the information, how the hell did that work as something that became this kind of valuable the information business. How did we get to the point where Schefter and Woj and Netflix, that information is the most valuable of things, not actual entertainment? It's, I mean, it feels like the housing crisis, right? It feels like how do we get to a point where people making $40,000 a year could afford, you know, million dollar homes and none of us, no, but there were no checks and balances to say, wait a second, should this happen? Because of late stage capitalism. The idea is that, look, as long as it keeps going, this Ponzi scheme keeps working, nobody cares. Why, why rock the boat? Right. But the reality is, like, the information is valuable when it's real. It's, uh, it's easier to understand when it's smaller in scope, when it's Netflix. Or even the housing crisis, you get to a little bit more complicated uh, avenue. But this is what the United States has been doing. As, as, as an economy, we've just been kicking the can down the road. Our economy, to a large degree, is a facade. It, it is, it is, Mike, but I think the concept of false information is has been growing over the last 20-some-odd years. Right, you like, can at least check our national like, debt. So I, I said housing crisis. You go back a little further. Enron. 
It was all it was all bullshit. They were all just moving things from one place to another place, selling stuff to themselves and calling it like, oh yeah, we made a bunch of money when they weren't making money at all. The difference is in you know finance, there is at least an SEC. Uh, if you're a public company, you have to have disclosures. You have to put your stuff out there. Over here in entertainment, there is no disclosure, right? Which is if Netflix had been honest from the beginning – about their numbers, if there were the equivalent of Nielsen ratings for these private streaming services from the beginning, they would not have grown to a place where now they are, what, too big to fail, which is exactly what happened with the housing crisis. You mentioned mentioned private companies, but Netflix is a publicly traded company, and it opens up an entirely different can of worms if people are thinking they're investing in something that's purported to be far more successful with zero pushback from the entity itself. But see, Mike, they're a public company. They have to disclose revenues, costs, et cetera. They don't have to disclose their internal performance metrics, which is the what the crux of what we're talking which about. Which is why they're they're – hiding right now trying to avoid that like the plague because it it makes things extra tricky as a publicly traded company. I wanted to ask Roy a question here because I imagine in the coming weeks and months we will be talking more about employers and employees. And I wanted to talk about Mike Babcock because I want to understand a little bit better why so many people in our audience would like their athletes to have a coach or a boss that they themselves <laughs> would never want to have as their coach or their boss. Uh, Roy, what are some of the details on on Babcock that make him unpleasant? Well, first, Mike Babcock has been an abusive coach to a lot of the players in this league. When he was with Detroit, it was a miserable experience for those players. Now, going into this Columbus Blue Jackets situation, he had players share pictures off of the phone uh, of what they did during the summer or whatever, put on the big screen TV for everybody to see. All right? That, that was the big problem that uh, Paul Bissonnette had during his po- podcast. He explained what happened. Uh, but to, team, to, help you out, to help you out, Roy, this report comes exclusively from Spit and Chicklets yes. that Biz is a part of. So it's basically – and Babcock has come out and blasted the reporting on this, denying several aspects of what Biz and Spin and Chicklets put out there. Yeah, he said it was family pictures that everybody wanted to share so that he could get to know the players better. That's what the team said. Of course, I don't believe that. Wait. Another liar. Wait, he's a liar. Well, well, he, he's, he's I putting, absolutely do not well, you're believe that up, Well, you're holding up a track record, and Biz and the rest of the Spinning Chicklets uh, crew are hearing this directly from players and the Blue Jackets have categorized it as a gross misrepresentation and are really coming out on the offensive from these things. Uh, Spin Chicklets had some very harsh words for this. If it's true, and let's just say their intentions were on it, if well, we want to trust Mike Babcock and say that this is just to see everyone's family pictures, it's kind of like a show and tell. Um, I guess we can maybe understand that a little bit, but at the most sinister, and if you reply what Mike Babcock's reputation is within the sport, it's hard to work up that kind of trust. I I need a little bit more exposition. So that's Mike Babcock's defense is, hey, I just want everyone to get to know each other. The coaches do a lot. It's like, hey, if you know your teammates, you're more invested. What is the sinister part that uh, Biz and the Spit and Chicklets people are saying happened? Basically sharing – Stuff they did over the summer, you know, like what was hanging out with women, hanging out in parties. The, and stuff the accusation like that. is that they airdrop their photos over there, and then Babcock is it's not just family photos, it's an invasion of privacy, and he's using this gambit of let's say uh, share family photos because we've had these really beneficial meetings where we're all getting to know each other. I'm in this new place, this is all getting to know you. And if you're a player that's like not feeling that and already suspicious of what Mike Babcock's intentions are, you'd consider this a big time invasion of it, your privacy. What is it? I'm trying to figure out, like. Like, what's the negative? Oh, my God. You think it's just family photos, but he's actually doing. The fact that he hasn't even coached a game yet with Columbus, that, that's a big problem. That's a red flag for me. He would use it in, in his defense. It's like, I'm just trying to get to know my players better. I know, but uh, what Amin is asking you is what is the great crime on this? I, I would say. As you it's could... been explained, I don't see. I, the way it's been explained, it doesn't matter 
Uh, there may be something more nefarious here, but the way that it's been explained is insufficient well, to Bi explain uh, why people are mad at him. Biz uh, trapped it like a casual rape reference in, in, in the retaliation. There's a lot of poison to Mike Babcock for what he's done. And if you do actually want to see photos of players' families, there are more discreet ways. There are better ways. There are ways to earn the trust of your players that aren't just airdrop me. Trust me. The part of this that I wanted to discuss with Amin, though, as a front office person and with me as a person who does not know the proper way to instill discipline in a staff. That is evident every day around here. I don't know how to be the asshole boss who's running around with my idea of vision and leadership. Everyone behave this way. Let's all be soldiers in an army united. I don't know how to do any of that stuff. It's not the greatest of icebreakers, Dan. Ah, not at all. All icebreakers suck, though. We can agree, right? Back yeah, in the day yeah. when it's like, all right, let's stand up and tell me one thing about you and what's your name. Like, I hated that. Except Dente and Ice. I love those guys. <laughs> Put it on the poll, uh, Juju. Do all icebreakers suck? And, and more to the point, I do want to go down this path because I've always dreaded this as well. Do you hate when you have to get up and tell everybody something about yourself? Tell us your name, where you're from, and one thing about you. Oh, <laughs> I, I once did a defensive driving class, one of those eight-hour things so you don't get the points on your license. And... Uh, you know, they made us say things several rounds, like well, something this, something that, something that. And the room that we did it in had all of those motivational posters, like with an eagle flying and it's like soaring uh, above your problems or whatever. You know, just like those stupid ass things. And every answer I gave was reading verbatim off of one of the posters, but delivered very dry. <laughs> you were Kaiser Soze. Nobody got it. Nobody got it. Everyone was just like, oh, that's a really good answer. I'm doing a thing. <laughs> I felt so bad because they were they were impressed. They were like, oh, wow, that's really there are There are personality types that do love the icebreaker getting to them. I am not one of those uh, personality types. Let's, let's do it right now. Please. Everyone go no, around the room. No, no. I feel like I look like I would from. love them, but I don't. You don't? I don't. I just hate them. I bet you Whittingham loves them. There oh, are personality sure. oh, types that love to just stride up in front of you. And yeah, you know what? I've been dying to tell you something about myself. I had cauliflower this morning. <laughs> I have Whittingham doing it by himself in his mirror every morning. Just what? a different, Hello a different there. fact. Yeah. Tell well, us a fact about yesterday. <laughs> While the statement says, I just want to say, I wanted to see family photos, players are texting, unnamed players are texting Ryan Whitney saying he calls our captain over to the center circle and says, uh, I want to see your photos on your phone. I want to know the type of person you are. If you're ice breaking, that's not how you phrase it. I think I want to look at all of your phones. Oh, God, no. I'll drop you my vacation pics, Dan. Anytime I, anyone opens up their phone and pulls all their – like goes to the Photos app and where they're – I'm just like, this is a dangerous game. You, I scrolled four times and I already saw a picture of my dick. Do you guys not use the hidden fi fi uh, feature on the iPhone? Android. Oh. <laughs> my mistake. You would be comfortable handing me your phone right now and just allowing me to look through it? Yeah, it's all just a bunch of pictures of stuff from Cinephobe, yeah, screenshots. Now, now, now the iPhone's doing the thing where it saves photos that have been texted to you into your library, and that is – Definitely not an option for me. <laughs> Put it on the poll, please, Juju, at Lebitard Show. Would you hand your phone over to a medium friend? <laughs> You're not medium. There's a lovely sliver of real estate on Miami Beach, Stugatz, which is undergoing a battering from local politics. Our old haunt, the Clevelander. Just like Billy Corbin told you on Because Miami for two years, they actively have blighted that entire area because that real estate is valuable and they want to knock down all those Art Deco buildings that go five blocks, or I'm sorry, five stories high. And allegedly, the Clevelander wants to become a 30-story, and this is one of the key words with all the real estate ripoffs around here, affordable housing facility. 30 stories high, so they can start stealing all the real estate that is beachside because there were shootings before we left, and the area has been actively blighted, and the Clevelander, as a strength point, is about to collapse. 
And it makes me sad as I see everything that is happening around South Florida, that on this lovely sliver of land, Lincoln Road, it's getting eaten up by cheesecake factories and places that just want to have advertising on a famous strip of land. But some things are disappearing that have been there for a long time that represent Miami history. And I was grateful the other day that Lincoln Road had somehow salvaged a giant piece of real estate where they still show movies, even though people aren't going to movies like that anymore. You can't have three-story movie house building on that prime a piece of real estate with just Barbie and Oppenheimer. But into the breach, September 22nd, the expendables are back <laughs> to save movie theaters. Put all your giant 70-year-old action stars in one movie and state them. You can come to. And weirdly, Kelsey Grammer at one point. The expendables. Really? Are, is it their fourth version now? Is Stallone still in them? Billy, I thought of you because they're here to save the movies. An action movie to save and rescue all action movies. Is Stallone or Schwarzenegger in it? Who is in Expendables 4? Okay, so this is Expendables 4, Dan, and it's very excited because the A in Expendables is the number four. So you know it's the fourth one. And then on the poster, the slogan is, Old Blood meets New Blood. Oh, wow. So it seems like... Old may- versus new. It seems like... Yeah. May- no, it seems like maybe this could be a passing of the torch amongst the Expendables here. Oh. Now, the top cast here listed is Jason Statham as Christmas. So he's there, number two, I guess. Hmm. And then we have Sylvester Stallone, 50 Cent... Megan Fox is going to be making her first appearance in the Expendables franchise, it looks like. Randy Couture will be back. There's just a who's... Oh, and Dan, your mom's favorite actor, Andy Garcia, will be playing Marsh in the Expendables 4. Yeah, so maybe you'll be going to see it, too. Wait a minute. So how many stars? Who's the star of this? Stallone. Duh. But is Schwarzenegger not around? He's not in this one, which makes me wonder, because he was in 3 if something happened to him in 3. Actually, you know what? I don't see him... Yeah, he was in three along with Kelsey Grammer, as you pointed out. Randy Couture was there. Oh, Terry Crews was in that one. Ronda Rousey. Three looks like it was a who's who. Oh, Harrison Ford was in it. (laughs) Mel Gibson, too. Did you not watch it? Antonio Banderas. Three was really the one I think you want to go see if you see it. Harrison Ford said, no, I'm 80. I'll keep my series alive with Indiana Jones. I'm not partaking in this foolery with you guys. He shouldn't be flying airplanes, right? Onward. No. 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 Chris Cody, this movie, The Expendables, you don't follow this? You don't care about this? It just stresses me out. All these actors. I mean, did Sloan die in the last one? Did you even see the third one? What do you mean it stresses you out? It's hard to keep up. He didn't didn't die because he's in this one. He never does. It's just. I don't think he's in this one. No, Stallone is alive. No, second cast. Schwarzenegger's not in in it. Has Stallone ever died in a movie? I don't know. Hmm. I just found out there were ghosts at the Clevelander. Mm -hmm. Our old haunt. You didn't know there were ghosts at the Clevelander? All those people on those uh, on those <laughs> sinks in the hotel rooms that are cemented in because people would have sex on them? What? You don't think that that was haunted? Is that why that was like that? Yes. Huh. You didn't know that? No. I was wondering. I thought it was just like maybe in the 50s they thought that it's a good idea to make sinks out of cement with rocks in them for some reason. Can you guys explain to me, because I don't remember who I was talking to, but they really disarmed a conversation that I was having when I talked about Denzel Washington as thespian, because he is just an exceptional actor, and asked why he would make three Equalizer movies. uh, For money? Yeah, no. but Because they're excellent? Well, this is where I want to thank you, both of you. I understand why they're getting made still. I appreciate all the help on this. But where I was headed with this is... He's also the actor who wants to do Macbeth and so and and really seminal work. And so I I asked sincerely and the answer was, well, he has made three equalizers and only one Macbeth. So clearly he likes making those. It seems like it's a lot of fun. He makes a lot of money. It'd be weird to make a Macbeth, too. Yeah, (laughs) there's only one. It's got to be easier, too, though, for him. Correct. It's, it's just an acting experience. Denzel Washington, at this point, doing Equalizer 3 is like, yes, I'll fool around for three months. That's not actually hard work. I don't actually have to summon a difficult character. I'll just be the guy I was in training day, now 70. I got a question for you, Dan. Did you see Macbeth with Denzel Washington? No one has. No. I saw the first 32 minutes of it. Right. 
I was there watching with my brother. It was an Apple exclusive, right? So I'm there on the couch watching it with him. 30 minutes go by, and I'm kind of checking my phone. I'm looking around, and, he, and my brother looks at me and said, do you understand anything that's happened? I'm like, no, this, this movie might as well have been in Mandarin because I have no idea what they've said once. And they're speaking English, and I have no clue. Okay, and this is what I want to ask been you there. about, uh, Stugatz. Are you someone who does any Apple streaming? There are some giant things on Apple streaming, and we know that Apple might be buying Disney. A Apple has all the money in the world. We're all addicted to ESPN, their advices. not Disney. No, oh, Disney too. Really? Yes, mm -hmm. the whole thing. The whole enchilada. The whole thing. Because Apple's one of the few companies in the world that can actually do this. And they have these giant things like, here's Denzel Washington as Macbeth exclusively on Apple. And none of it seems to be landed. If I did stream on Apple, you have me stopping at Macbeth with Denzel Washington? I'm asking you who's consuming Apple because clearly they want to win the streaming wars and they might do it by just buying Disney. I saw Hijack. Hijack was good with uh, Idris Elba. I thought it was a good little series. Eight, but but eight they, that, that, I have not heard anything. I see this one show, Invasion, and I'm like, this looks like a giant expensive show. I can't even imagine how much all this must have cost. Is anyone talking about this show? There's a giant show on Apple, Invasion, that is one of their most popular shows, but I don't know how many people are streaming Apple that's not for Messi or for some other sports thing that they want. It was Ted Lasso. That, that, that was the reason for people actually watching television shows on Apple. But do they still have that kind of buzz? Because they're spending an awful lot of expendables type money on these giant projects that are existing in a universe that I don't hear people talking about. It. They all talked about Ted Lasso, Stu guys. And the second thing that people have talked about at Apple is the Michael J. Fox documentary is amazing. Amazing. A great piece of work. Macbeth at the box office did five hundred and twenty-four thousand oh. dollars. Was it Blackbird? Blackbird's excellent. Yeah, I, I, in terms of word of mouth, Blackbird. Jason Siegel has some show. Shrinking, Shrinking is another go. Bill Lawrence show. But I'm just talking about for the amount of money spent. Look, I don't understand the streaming business. What I do understand is that Apple has all the money in the world to do whatever it wants because we're all addicted to their devices. The world is addicted and needs their devices, except for Roy, who has an Android. Did you watch Coda? I did not. Coda won Best Picture at the Oscars. That was an Apple. Yes. Uh, they won. That's another. Uh, that was a credit. That's exactly what Apple wants to do with its content. Yeah. An Apple TV movie that you would go there for exclusivity won Best Picture. And I'm breaking that to 90% of our audience, <laughs> certainly our studio right now. And when the habits change, the, my, the larger point that I was trying to make is, for how long can the Expendables keep up with that? Forever. <laughs> I mean, if it costs $100 million and brings in four, they can keep doing them forever, because right. that's what's paying for these Macbeth movies that no one's watching. That's exactly right. You do three equalizers, and that allows you to do Macbeth. Yeah, these that's passion it. projects. Yes. Yep. I feel like a lot of these shows, and maybe we can ask Mike Sure, people that actually know the answer to this, because I don't, but I'm just going to say it like I do. I feel like a lot of these shows and movies just get made because the people making decisions want to be friends with Denzel Washington. So like, ah. Eh, We'll give him a movie. We'll give him a show he wants, and then he has to sit in with a couple of meetings. We'll hang out. Oh, we got a business dinner. You got to go to dinner with me and my wife, whatever. And then, boom, movie's out. No one watches it. No one cares because you got your $100 million meeting with Denzel Washington. Well, we talked earlier this week about the business that Peyton Manning is building in retirement. So guys, I'm genuinely fascinated by this part. I don't know if the rest of the people are, but if Gilbert Arenas and the Kelseys and uh, Pat McAfee can have this one ecosystem that seems – like, wow, there's a lot of money there, play money. If I flood the entire market with a bunch of competition-aholics who want to be Tom Brady making $375 million a year, and one of the things I throw in there is here's LeBron, and he wants to do what Billy is doing, where he goes all over Hollywood and just makes media deals from people who want LeBron to sit in a room with them. And no shade to LeBron, but LeBron gets to make whatever. Like, that's why he moved to L.A., so he could buy a team. And so all of these guys can compete for dollars where real ownership resides in sports, which is owning the teams. It's not, it's not just running businesses. Peyton Manning's going to make more on Omaha Productions than he made in his career. So that's why wouldn't these guys compete in this marketplace? Just out of curiosity, not because I'm pondering my own future or anything like that. Does anyone want to sit in a room with you? <laughs> Besides me and Greg. 
Yeah. Some days, you and Greg. There are many days right. Stugatz doesn't seem to want to you, sit in the room with that me. That cachet either. where some big fat whale that's just willing to spill money <laughs> over the bar to hang out with Dan Lebetard. Like, do you have that cachet anymore, or did we give it to McAfee? Oh, I don't have it anymore, but Skipper might still have it. He's the one making documentaries. <laughs> did you ever have it? He's making the documentary. Dan had deals. it. Yeah, Dan, had it. It. Dan yeah. had it. Dan yeah. had it. When yeah. He was yeah. like, oh, you're the guy that sits with the old man. On uh, When I walk past the airport, I see you occasionally. Yeah. Like, whoa, bam, bam. Like, you used to have it. What was LeBron doing in Saudi Arabia? Explaining the timing of his tweet, I hope. He did not explain that story to the people because soon after his son... He sent the tweet from Saudi Arabia, Mike. He no, wasn't explaining it, was it? No, what I'm talking about is when when Bronny had the thing. And um, thing, it's uncomfortable It's thing. uncomfortable talking about it. I think he had cardiac arrest. He had cardiac, cardiac arrest, arrest. yeah. And, and, and then a couple hours... So, like, we've deduced that it happened in the morning and he knew about it and, once again... Credit to the reporters out there. Keep in mind, this happened in, inside the 30-mile zone. Like It wasn't reported. That went out there. People were aware of this, and they had the, the decision and the presence of mind to say, we're not going to run this until like a day later. So a day later, we find out that Bronny James had uh, cardiac arrest. So we find out with the timeline that it happened in the morning. And then remember that day LeBron James had a tweet that was when everyone was having fun with the Saudi Arabia thing, him putting out basically a meme on his social media. And if you actually like get into the weeds, like that tweet was sent after he knew about the the Bronny James thing. So I'm not judging. Why, why did you laugh at that? Uh, why was that it's the a, place that you laughed? I'm I'm not laughing. I'm just. I mean, it's odd timing. It's for odd that tweet, timing. Right? It's odd timing for yes. that tweet. If you're just applying, like, what would I do in that situation? As a lot of people. There've been there's been a very small part of the internet that's wondered like wait we're firing off jokes here I'm not telling him how to mourn maybe he found out he was okay it's just curious timing and all of it telling him how to mourn scheduled tweet has to be the most likely thing right no. that he just had uh, it scheduled or no the most likely thing is is someone from his team who wasn't aware sent it out of what was happening yes, yes but there is the the one quote from LeBron in the past saying I I send out all my own tweets. Yeah. At the time, notice yeah. I'm saying tweets and not X because I received a mysterious Venmo from someone <laughs> several several weeks ago, and I was receiving lots of Venmos because I'm treasurer of a, a pick'em league, but I didn't recognize the name. And I'm going through it, and it was for the exact buy-in. It was for fifty dollars, and I use a messaging portion of Venmo to be like, "Hey, are you in the pick'em league? What is this for?" And the person found my Venmo. <laughs> And it was just like, I'm paying you $50 so you can stop referring to Twitter as X. So there you go. I'm holding up my end of the bargain. I'm not giving mm. the $50 back. Good. It's just going to be forever more Twitter. <laughs> that, person has some, that person has some money to spend. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you in your spare time want to pick up the habit of treasurer? Of anything? Well, someone has to do it. Yeah. Someone has. It's yeah. a dirty the job, worst. and someone has to do it. No one wants to be the commissioner of a fantasy league. Right. No one wants to be the. Tra it's the so, worst. And Mike is very people. good at it. Like Mike, I was at, I was late. <laughs> no shock there. What's in your throat? It's coming out. <laughs> it's out. Five, uh, I was five, late. To, five, I, no five, way! I held five. it back. Mike bailed me out. There's no way. No, that's not fine. Thank you. Thank you. You didn't clear it. So I sent it to Mike, you know, a day late. He was all over me saying, hey, you owe me $50, and you have to make your pick. And so Mike is very good at this. No one wants to do it. It's a thankless job, Dan, but someone has to do I'm it. The and Mike's the guy. I run a fantasy league, and it's not that cheap. A couple hundred dollars per team. And I got paid, and I've already, like, spent most of it. And, I, and now I owe, like, 1200 bucks. this stupid thing. Hopefully I win and just break even. 